Carl, thank you so much for joining us on Uncover Wealth Radio today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Carl, you're here today to speak about building a legacy for wealth, for generational wealth. What does that even mean? What, is, what does it mean to build a legacy for generational wealth? What is that? So, I, I, I kind of got into this whole legacy um, conversation about, about four years ago. I really kind of got into, you know, personal development. I've, I've been a deal maker for 28 years now. So I've, I've been buying and selling and growing businesses all over the world and over 330 transactions. And um, about four years ago, I really got into kind of mindset and, and personal development as, as well, just for me to kind of level up, you know, my own performance and then being able to translate that down into the leadership teams of the, the portfolio companies that I either own or, or I'm invested in uh, all over the world. And one of the kind of key questions that, that has always kind of hit me is, is why, why as human beings do we do what we do? Yes. And um, you can apply that to relationships, to health and wellness, and you can also apply that to, to business. And uh, I was on a, um, the first podcast I ever did about four years ago, you know, somebody asked me a question and they said, so why, why would somebody want to buy a business? And I actually replied and said, well, nobody wants to buy a business. Nobody, no, nobody wants to own a business. Um, what we want are the benefits that translate from business ownership. And so the, the, the business is just a vehicle to create what you want to have in your life. And yeah. for some people, that's wealth creation and cash flow. For some people, that's pride. It could be ego. It could be freedom. It could be having a work-life balance, spending more time with, with your family. But, but for me, the reason why I buy businesses and I buy so many and why I coach 5,500 entrepreneurs all over the world to do what I do, to buy businesses and scale businesses, is for me, it's all about legacy. Uh, I want to build something that is bigger than me and has a bigger impact and is something that's going to be around, you know, when I'm, you know, long gone, you know, I'm 50 in a few months. So in, in 30 or 40 years time, when I, when I shuffle off this planet, um, I want my stuff to still be used and still be around. So for me, that that's all about legacy. And a lot of the entrepreneurs that, that I mentor and I coach, they, um, they're coming along to the same way, way of thinking because you know, if you own, let, let's, let's say you own a one million pound a year business right now and you're hustling every day to win new customers and, and, and scale that business. What I'm communicating to all my clients is um, there's a much faster, cheaper and less risky way to scale your business and that is to go and acquire another business that's complementary to what you do and bolt the two together. And you can literally double the size of your business and probably quadruple your profits by doing that in the space of about 30 to 60 days. And you can do it in a lot of cases without you actually having to invest your own money. You can use other people's money. You can use external financing. You can use angel investors. And you can actually buy businesses and pay the seller over time for the acquisition of the company. And, and that's all great, but that's all the kind of the mechanics. It all boils down to then, you know, why do you want to do that? And when you understand your why and your real purpose in, in, in life, and, and it doesn't matter what you're trying to do, lose weight, fix a relationship, get a better job, grow your existing business, you've got to boil it down to, you know, why you actually want to, to do that. Because once you know your true why, you get leverage over yourself. And that is the fuel that pushes you forward when you want to quit. Um, you know, there's, 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 been, there's been a billion, billion dollar ideas created in this world, but there isn't a billion billionaires. Yeah. And that's the reason. The people that fail, um, they don't have their, their purpose really dialed in. So for me, it's all about legacy. That's what drives me forward. You know, I've been financially free for a long time, but I still work very hard every single day because for me, it's not about wealth creation. It's not about cash flow. Uh, it's about the legacy that I want to build 
for myself and my family that's going to outlive me once I, I stop doing this. Nice. I love it, Carl. Um, so if we think, okay, maybe there is an easier way to growth and to achieve the revenue that we want and to achieve the business that we want to get and to live the life that we want to live and the success that we define as we define it, maybe there is an easier way than uh, that and that organic growth and that is through acquisition. How on earth do we go about deciding what type of business that we would might want to acquire yeah. and how do we evaluate if it's even worth acquiring in the first place? How, how would it fit into our own business? How do we, how do we figure all that stuff out? Yeah. So that, that, that's an absolutely fantastic question. Um, there's actually three parts to that answer. Um, so the, the first part is you, you need to define, I think at a, at a strategic level, at a visionary level, you know, what, what you want your business to become. So let's say you're at a million pounds in turnover, which is still, you know, a, a very big business. Did you know only 1% of all businesses ever get to a million pounds in turnover? 1%. In the digital sphere, it's 1.2%. Mm. So if you own an online business, if you're a coach and you deliver and sell coaching online, then only 1.2% ever get to seven figures. Uh, yeah. In brick and mortar, it's about 1%. So 99% of all businesses never, ever get to that level. And, and a lot of people, when they get to a million, they think, that's it, I've made it. But you know, if, you're, if, if you're making a million pounds in turnover and you're at, say, a 10% margin, if you're online, it's probably a lot higher. Yeah. But the, you know, the average profit margin is around 10%. Then £100,000 a year is still not a massive amount of money. So there's still a lot of reasons why you, you should grow a business. So obviously, there's two ways to grow any business. You can grow it organically, uh, more customers, more leads, more products and services, or you can go and buy another business. So when you're buying another business, the first thing you need to figure out is, you know, why, why do you want to buy another business? So there's, there's only three reasons why you would buy a business. The first one is uh, you go and buy a competitor. So let's mm -hmm. say you're um, let let's say you're a dentist, and you're doing a million pounds a year. And the guy down the street, uh, who's one of your competitors, he's looking to sell his business, um, and he's also doing a million pounds. So you could buy his business. So now you're a two million pound version, and you've just doubled down on your market share. So that's one reason. The other reason is you can buy into your supply chain. So let's say you're a manufacturing company and if you go through your income statement or your profit and loss, let's say in your cost of sales, 30% of your cost base is buying components or whatever it is from other suppliers. You can buy that company and then you're locking in more profit in your own business plus you've got the ability to then scale the business that you've already bought and there'll be some kind of cross pollination of products and services. The third reason, and this is the most popular reason is you buy in a sector or a niche as we call it in the States, mm -hmm. uh, that's very complementary to you. So for example, let's say you own a software company and you're doing a million pounds in revenues or in turnover. Um, you could go and buy an IT services company that's doing a million pounds. And then what you can do is you can sell your software to the IT services customers that you just acquired. Also, you can sell the IT services you just acquired back to your existing software customers. So you get cross-selling. So it's a one plus one equals two and a half, say, on the turnover side. And then as you bring two businesses together, there's a lot of costs that you can eradicate. So there's a lot of synergies. We call those deal synergies. So the biggest one is probably the salary and benefits of the previous owner. You'll be able to save on administration costs. As a bigger business, you might have better economies of scale. So in that example, when you combine them together, you're a million pound business. You buy another million pound business. Within 12 months, that might be a 2.5 million pound business. And if you're only making a 10% profit margin, you've got the 10% plus the 10% of the business you've acquired, but then you're able to strip out 
all these extra costs. So within a year, you could be at two and a half million on the turnover line, making six, seven, eight hundred thousand pounds in profit. So you are compounding the value of your business, and if you own it, your own personal net worth. Mm. So that's part one. So once you've figured out what which of those three avenues you want to go down, then you go into a bit more detail. So then when you start originating deals, so either through brokers or direct approaches or, or building networks of, um, of other people, you will start to solicit deals. And then when you look at all those deals, then you'll go through um, a, a kind of qualitative analysis of does that, is that business really going to move the needle for me? You know, is it going to give me the stronger competitive edge that I'm looking for? Is it going to allow me to integrate more with my supply chain? Is it going to allow me to have a bigger business and offer more products and services with a wider customer base by buying something complementary? Um, so that's the second stage. And then the third stage is then once you've agreed the terms on the deal, so you've agreed how much are you going to pay for this business? And secondly, what are the terms of the purchase, i.e. how much of the money are you going to pay um, at completion? And then how much of the money are you going to pay in the future? Once you've agreed that, then you will go through a process called due diligence. And what due diligence is, it's like when you buy a house in it. So when you buy a house, you might have a property survey and your solicitor um, we'll, we'll go through the, the title and, and make sure that the house is safe to buy. You'll do searches to make sure that there's no coal mines underneath or methane gas. In a business, um, your due diligence is kind of split into three parts. So the first thing you'll do is you'll have your accountant just go through the books, make sure that the tax returns are correct, uh, the value of the assets are true, the turnover and the profits that have been stated you know, are all true and accurate. Uh, your lawyer will then do uh, legal due diligence just to make sure that the business is safe to buy. There's no pending litigation. There's no major issues that, that you're going to cause you some problems. And then you'll do some commercial due diligence, which you'll probably do yourself uh, because you know the space. And you'll just make sure that, you know, the customers are who they say they are, what they're doing in their market is, is correct. Um, you know, all those different things. And so you go through that process really over about a 60 day period. And the, the further you get into the deals, the, the more detail you, you get. And it's, it's like deal making is like a sales funnel. So if you own a business today and, and you know, you sell to customers, um, you might have 100 customers in your funnel, and you might get 15 to 20 to buy your product or service. It's the same when you're buying businesses, not every single business is going to be the right fit for you uh, for what you're looking to achieve, you know, in that strategic vision that you've got. Um, so that's, that's the process that, uh, that you would go through. But it's a very similar thing to, uh, to buying and selling houses. Uh, it's just a different kind of research method and a different way of, of verifying that what you're buying is safe. Nice. And so when it comes to buying a business, how important are the finances of the business you're purchasing? I know that you said there's these kind of bits that, that make it up in terms of the decisions, but is the finances, the current finances of the business, is that a big part of the decision making process or actually do some of these other things outweigh the current finances because perhaps the current owner is not so great at managing those? Yeah, so that, that's a really, really good question. Um, if, uh, if you were asking me about a large deal, mm -hmm. so um, and back in my day when, when I was in investment banking doing you know, billion pound deals and above, mm -hmm. um, it's really all about the numbers. Yeah. But when you're doing small deals, so I, I specialize now in the, the kind of 500,000 pound to 10 million pound turnover range. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at those deals, um, it's more about the seller psychology mm -hmm. than it is about the numbers. Uh, the numbers are important because number one, you want to buy a business that's profitable. Yeah. Um, I don't really advocate people buying businesses out of bankruptcy or buying businesses that are, are truly distressed because then you know you've got a really tough job 
you know, trying to turn that business around. I would rather advocate for you buying a, a profitable business that's very quickly going to move the needle in the business that you, you already have. Um, because if a business is profitable and it's got a very healthy balance sheet, then you can finance the transaction. So let, let's say you find a business, um, let's say it's a million pounds in turnover and it's making a hundred thousand pounds in profit. On average, that business is going to be worth about a three times multiple. So that business is worth 300,000 pounds. You don't have to rock up to that deal with a 300,000 pound check. You can, if you want to, but what you can do is something called a leveraged buyout where you might have to put say 10% of the purchase price down, say 30,000 pounds, but then um, you can you can finance the rest of the transaction. You might finance some of it through um, debt financing. So your bank or or a specialist financier um, would step in and give you some of the money. And then in, in virtually every single deal that I've ever done, um, I've never paid the seller all of the money at completion. I've always held some of that money back. In some cases, a hundred percent of the money I just bought the business and paid for it over time. So that's why the numbers are important, but to put as much of the deal as you can into those future deferred payments, what you've then got to do is really understand the seller psychology. And what I mean by that is, what is the true motivation for the seller to want to retire or exit? Uh, it could be retirement. It could be that they're completely burnt out. They, they could be sick. They could be sadly dying in some cases and, and not just them it could be a, a, a significant family member they might just be bored or frustrated or, or just run out of ideas what we're seeing right now is a lot of sellers coming to market wanting to sell their businesses because of coronavirus mm. and yet their businesses are thriving the businesses are still doing really really well obviously you know hotels bars restaurants airlines they've all really suffered but a lot of the traditional manufacturing companies, online businesses, transportation, construction, engineering companies, uh, they haven't really skipped a beat through these last six months. But the owners, uh, and this is something that has really kind of um, been important over the last, I would say, 10 years, is business owners, they get to a stage where they get consumed with, with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We, we call it FUD in, in online marketing. <laughs> and when they get to that stage, um, irrespective of the fundamentals of their business, they just psychologically need to leave for mm. all of the reasons or, or any of the reasons that, that I mentioned before. And when you get to that stage, when you've got a highly motivated seller that really wants to leave their business and quickly, then that allows you as a buyer to you know pretty much dictate your own terms and you know you might offer the seller the price they want so let's say they want three hundred thousand pounds for their business um that's fine we'll pay you three hundred thousand pounds but i might offer to pay you that over five years i might pay you you know sixty thousand pounds a year or five thousand pounds a month um and, and i'll buy your business and if i don't pay you you get the business back as, as part of the of the legal agreement. And you'd be really surprised, Annette, how many sellers will take that. Because a lot of sellers, the only reason they've stayed in their business is they still need to make the £5,000 a month that the business pays them yeah. to live their life. You know, they haven't got that nest egg to go off and do something different. So, but they hate going into their business. They don't want to be there anymore. So for you to take their business on and say, look, I'll deal with all this stuff. I will integrate it into the business I've already got. Um, I will pay you whatever you were taking out of that business, and I'll pay you over five years. Yeah. Bearing in mind, when you sell a business, um, as long as you sell the shares in the business and you've owned them for more than a year, it's a lot more tax beneficial to get the money that way than by paying yourself a salary or a or a dividend up, up to a million pounds now in um, selling your business you only pay 10 percent capital gains tax mm. used to be up to 10 million but the chancellor changed that back in uh, back in march just before the lockdown um so 
which I, I think was a crazy uh, thing for him to do. But but still, you know, most deals that are done uh, are at or below the million pound mark. Mm. So it means that sellers are still being able to sell their business and paying very little tax um, from doing that. So um, so that gives them a lot of motivation, you know, to want to do this. So just to recap on the question, I know I've spoke for a bit, but it was a stunning question that needed a lot of detail. Um, it's... Um, it is about the numbers, but it's more importantly about the psychology. Interesting. And so tell me, if we, if we think, okay, this is going to be a great method to grow our business, how frequently should we think about purchasing a business? Is this something you can do annually or is it something you might want to be doing every five years? What's the, what do you recommend to people in terms of how often they should be implementing this as quickly as your hunger and your mindset dictates nice. um, there's there's no reason why you can't be doing this constantly uh there's no reason why you can't be doing deals like this once a quarter um you know i'll, I'll tell you a story um when, when i started coaching people how to do this which was about five years ago mm-hmm. one, of, one of the first five students that uh, enrolled into my, my, my coaching program. Mm. Um, he was a, um, he was an optician, um, that worked in somebody else's optical business. Oh. And he, he bought the program, um, and on, on the kind of group coaching calls that we have every week, you know, he, he said, Hey, you know, Carl, I, I, I invested in your program. It's really good. I'm going through all the training. I want to buy, the business that I currently work for. Um, my, my boss, who's the owner, uh, he wants to retire and, and he's given me first refusal on buying the business. I've never bought a business before. I don't know anything about it. That's why I want you to coach me, to teach me how to do it. So uh, I took him through the process uh, and he acquired uh, that business. And then about three weeks later, what he'd done is he'd, he'd systematized the business that he was already in to the point where he was working on the business, not in the business. So he wasn't doing the eye tests. He wasn't dispensing the glasses or the lenses. Um, he, he was the owner of the business, not the operator of the business. He'd backfilled himself mm-hmm. with somebody else. Um, he said, so, so what do I do now? Um, should I go and buy another business? I said, absolutely. Um, there's, there's about 4,000 independent optician businesses in the UK, the other 4,000 are owned by the big chain, Specsavers and Boots and all those companies. So he started off going and, and acquiring those businesses. Today, he owns nearly 80, eight zero. Wow. He's built a phenomenally massive group of independent opticians. Um, and then when you buy more businesses like that, um, you're able to kind of suck out a lot of those um, specific instances of cost in each location. So if you look at a single location, um, they've got their marketing budget, they've got costs for HR, legals, accounting, admin, uh, all those different things. Yeah. When you own more of those, then you can have a little centralized team that does that work for each of the different locations. And then you know, if, if you're buying frames and you own one practice, you might pay... 60 pounds for a pair of frames if you've got 80 you're paying like four pounds for a pair of frames so your economies of scale go up exponentially so that's that buy and build strategy has allowed him to go from a single entity to owning a massive you know i'm guessing a hundred million pound um company now that that's, that's worth probably a hundred million pounds. So, and he's done all that through, uh, through doing acquisitions. So, um, so you can do this as often, you know, as you want. One of the keys to doing this is as, as the CEO of your company, you need to move to working on your business, not in your business. If you're in your business every day and your business relies on you every day to do what it does, then it's very difficult to be uh, buying lots of businesses because yeah. you'll be spending all of your time in your business and not on your business. Once yeah. you free yourself... You can't step out and be strategic when you're stuck. That's right. 
That's right. When, when you step out of your business, then really you have five jobs to do in that business. You have a, a visionary and strategic role, and then you should be doing mergers, acquisitions, exits, and joint ventures. Nice. Leave the running of the business to somebody else. And that could be a partner um, that you can give a little bit of equity to to incentivize them. Or it could be somebody that you, uh, you, know, you make them your general manager or your managing director and you make them a, a profit interest partner. You give them a share of the profits, yet you still own all of the equity in the business. And then uh, that means then that somebody else is driving your bus um, free of any accidents and you're able to go and acquire all the next buses. Um, and, and then your team in your business can still help you with a lot of that detailed work. So you can be the deal maker, finding the deals, building the relationships, raising the capital, all that stuff. But a lot of the detail can be done by leveraging your existing team. And, and they'll find it really, really exciting because they'll think they're part of a business that's really starting to accelerate. Uh, yeah. And I'm not saying don't ever do organic growth. I'm not <laughs> saying that, you know. Um, you know, one, one of the first things I do in any business I buy is really, really dial in the marketing um, to really get the organic growth moving faster than what it's done before. But you can turbocharge your growth by supplementing that with um, what I call either bolt-on or tuck-in acquisitions. And you can also buy businesses that are larger than the one that you already have. I, I owned a tiny, tiny little corporate workwear company about 10 years ago. It was doing about half a million pounds in turnover. Um, and that allowed me to go and buy um, a company that was doing nearly 12 million pounds in turnover, making nearly 2 million pounds in profit. It was a carve out from a big, large corporate. Uh, and again, I was able to acquire that business into my tiny one um, without investing any of my own money. I was able to finance 100% of, uh, of that transaction. So, um, you know, when you're buying businesses, they don't need to be smaller than you. They can be the same size or they can even be larger. That's a really great tip as well, because I know a lot of people will be looking thinking, well, you know, my business is doing okay, but I don't want to buy something smaller that's got even more problems in there than I have. No, you, you can definitely buy bigger. Um, and, and the interesting thing is, uh, it, it's, no, it, it's no more difficult. It's actually easier to buy a larger business than it is to buy a smaller business because all of their ducks are going to be in a row. It's going to be easier to do the due diligence. And uh, what you're going to have in that larger business are assets and, and people and other resources that uh, would cost you an awful lot of money yeah. to bring in to you know, your smaller version of that. Um, so the, the technical term for that in it is called a, a reverse takeover or reverse acquisition. But at the end of the day, it, it makes no difference. Uh, legally and technically, it's exactly the same process. Interesting. Carl, this session has been incredible. I know you've certainly given me a lot of food for thought around how I might be thinking about changing up some growth strategies over the next, over the next, well, every quarter, quite frankly, <laughs> um, as often as I can do this. This is definitely something that I am going to be going away and, uh, and delving into much more deeply. So Carl, tell everyone how they can get in touch with you, how they can find you around the internet and all those good things sure so what i've done for you annette and and, and I, I i recommend if this interests you you should jump into this straight away and uh, i'm going to make this offer available to uh your your fantastic tribe Lovely. is i've put together some some excellent free training on how this process exactly works because it's not for everybody Mm -hmm. if you're stuck working in your business today and you're really in the trenches and you can't breathe yeah. buying a business is a mistake mm -hmm. you need to free yourself up obviously we can help you do that um but if you're curious about this then i've put together uh, some really good free resources that you can consume and if you then um really want to be serious about this then there's lots of different ways that uh, that we can help you so 
if you um, if you and your audience go to trainwithcarl.com forward slash uncover. So that's trainwithcarl.com forward slash uncover. That's your private link for your audience right. to uh, download and consume um, all of my goodies. Uh, they can check me out at uh, dealmakerwellsociety.com as well. Um, that's the, uh, the website for my coaching business. They can check out my private equity company, which is proxcapitalgroup.com as well. You can see what we're, what we're doing there. And then we're all over YouTube and, and all those different things. We have a ton of training as well on, on YouTube at Dealmaker Well Society. So, uh, so, so yeah, if people are interested in this, then definitely um, go consume uh, some of these resources and see if, if, if this is something that um, can help you move the needle in your business, make it bigger and help you build a legacy and, and some generational wealth that um, not only you, but your family, your community, are going to be able to uh, to also enjoy. Lovely. I love it, Carl. I will definitely head to that URL. Also put it in the show notes for everyone as well so that you guys can, uh, you, as you're listening, you can head across there as well. Thank you again, Carl. This has been an absolute pleasure to speak to you today and speak, we'll speak soon. Thank you.